In this presentation from Knowledge uh, Base, I will be talking about data center and mainly uh, about ensuring tier level integrity with the use of uh, the latest technology available in physical security. Uh, so when I start, I will be talking first about uh, the demand of data center, so data center demand and how it's growing and how we see that it will continue to grow. Then I'll talk about the types of data centers before I go and talk about the components and system that form a data center. From there, I will go and talk about the different tier levels from tier one to tier four, what uh, makes a data center a tier three or tier four or tier two or whatever, and what are the redundancy requirements for each tier. And from from there, I will jump to talk about the requirements for ensuring, for, uh, the, ensuring a, a data center is secure. And we will look at the latest technologies that are available today to secure a data center uh, from a physical perspective uh, today. Uh, I will uh, make sure to uh, have sections in my video. So if you look under the video when it's published, you will see that there is sections where you can jump from one section to the other, making it easier, easier for you to go to your uh, desired section or topic you're looking for. Uh, as well, if you have not subscribed to my channel and uh, you find this interesting, please uh, subscribe. Uh, and uh, leave me your comments and feedback in the comment section as we go. So let's uh, get going and start talking first about data center demand. And here I want to tell a story about a small uh, virtual uh, village or town called Dataville. And in Dataville, uh, before they were using data centers or technology or whatever, when it started, they started using a few computers here and there to to manage uh, different stuff at the village. Uh, and as they used, started using these computers, they found that it's easier to digitalize things. It makes life easier in the city. They put the records of the residents of the town on, on, uh, on the computers. Now they can track who's moving in and out of the town, how many residents they have. Uh, they can get that in a click of a, a mouse click, uh, so on as they, found that is helpful, they moved their utilities into the digital system. So they brought their electrical systems. Now their uh, metering system in the city was makes sense now instead of going and doing manual uh, reading of uh, meters, they made it digital. And now with having more uh, digitalized system, they've, they're computers that they were using are not enough now. So they, they grew their computer requirement. They have more computers, more servers. And now if they have any uh, fallout in electricity and power or in cooling or any server goes down, they have an interruption of their whole services in the city. So they thought, okay, well, let's do something. And they built something, which now we call a data center. So they are, now they have a data center that is more reliable, secure, it's scalable, it's easy to add servers into the data center. It's more uh, energy efficient because they have it uh, they, they are it's purposely built to host these things and when they when they had all this built up that invited more uh, innovation and more system to come and make use of this infrastructure which is the data center so and, and that's what we see today and how things are developing we we see like from using our personal computers first a long time back to run everything disconnected from the internet and then we are connected in networks and now we're connected to the internet and everybody will now has an application running on the cloud and what's cloud it's a data center now the more uh, cloud availability is there and the more easier it is to use the cloud and when i say cloud these are data centers that are all around us or, or, or somewhere in the world we become more dependent on them and the demand is increasing so the numbers of applications uh, that we run on a cloud uh, is increasing day and day uh, and that's driving more demand on data centers if we look at the number of data centers today that are available and this uh, statistics is from uh, early 2024 uh, this year we see that in the united states alone there is uh, almost a uh, 5400 data centers which is massive and these numbers are growing in the us and globally and this is all driven 
uh, by uh, a lot of applications, a lot of IoT devices that are being uh, added to the network, being connected to uh, to the internet day on day. Um, if you look at your mobile phones, you think that that is one IoT device. You may be right, but every application that runs on your mobile phone has a con has a a component or a part in the cloud in a data center that supports it. Uh, I speak for myself. I have uh, maybe uh, I don't know, 10 to 15 pages of applications on my phone. Not that I use them uh, all every day, but I have them there and there is millions of applications available for us, each one demanding uh, a space in a data center or on the cloud. And these are growing. Physical IoT devices are growing as smart homes grow, as uh, smart cars grow. Everything now is connected to the internet. They are connected to a cloud. They are using space in the cloud. So we see the demand growing and continue to grow. So just look around you and see how many devices you have on you connected to the internet. From your smartwatch to your uh, phone, uh, to your laptop that you work on, to your smart lights. If you're sitting uh, in a smart office, you have your thermostat now. Uh, for years, thermostats are connected to the internet. So the number of IoT devices that everyone has connected is growing. And as these grow, there is more demand on uh, data centers. So here are some statistics or some uh, expectations on IoT growth. And uh, it's, it's evident that the, the amount of data collected each year is growing. And the expectation is in 2025, we'll have 175 zettabyte. And this is from uh, a 2018 uh, study or expectation. However, I, I was at the Big C conference uh, only uh, last week, the Big C uh, uh, Fall Conference 2024, and the number for 2025 this year was, I believe, 187 zettabytes. So it's even more than what was the expectation in 2018. So we are meeting and exceeding expectation in terms of the number of data that we are generating year on year. So it's said that every year we're generating data equal to all, so every last two years, we're generating data more than we have generated since forever. So it's doubling as we go on a yearly basis. Now, as as this demand is growing, we see also uh, a big shift to the edge. So we, we see more adoption of edge processing, more dependency on the edge. And that's why the growth in IoT and in, uh, in the technology is not always linear with data centers. So we're trying, we're still growing in data center space, but we're trying to move a lot of the processing outside the data center and bring it to the edge. So that will allow us to do more scalability on the edge. So uh, I talk uh, from security industry, uh, for example, where uh, the surveillance cameras today uh, they have processing units that are capable of deep learning on the edge. And instead of sending a full uh, stream of uh, video back to the data center or the servers, the cameras can analyze the scene and send only metadata depending on the requirement or they analyze the scene if there is something interesting only they send the footage back to be stored. So we're saving or we're reducing the demand on the data centers uh, as we grow the edge analytics and the edge, the power of the edge uh, as we go on. Um, so in the past two years, the products that were released in like surveillance and in cameras, every device that was released or uh, re-engineered in the past two years has a deep learning processor built into it. So it can do all these analytics on the edge and then send only metadata. And we'll talk about this in the last section when we start talking about uh, data center security requirements. So moving on, let's talk about the types of the data centers. And we see three main types of data centers. Uh, we've always seen them, and those are the hyperscales, the co-location, and the enterprise data centers. And I'll talk as we go about each one in detail. However, one more type that we have seen in the past 10 years come out a lot is edge data center. With Same as the devices are getting smarter at the edge, we're also trying to push more data 
to the edge, closer to the edge. So instead of sending everything to a data center, we don't need to do that. We have an edge data center that can host that. So uh, if I talk about surveillance, your servers on site could sit on an edge data center. That's an edge data center that reduces the need of a hyperscale data center or the cloud. So you store your data in there, you process it, and uh, I'll take again the case of uh, security surveillance application. If you have an incident, you have a case that you want to keep that data for a longer time, then you can push that data to the cloud and keep it for longer, where on the edge you are storing for 60 days, 90 days, 30 days, depending on your requirement and the calculation you need. So let's talk about a hyperscale data center. A hyperscale data center is usually defined to have more than 5,000 servers uh, and more than 10,000 square feet. And these data centers are usually owned by Microsoft, Facebook, Google, Amazon, uh, those uh, mega companies that uh, offer cloud services. Uh, and we see it in terms of uh, their applications that we use. So if you use Gmail, you're definitely taking part. You're using the cloud. You're using the Google Cloud, and all your emails are being stored there. If you so use Microsoft Office, you're definitely using the cloud. Uh, same uh, Amazon, AWS, Amazon Web Services. They provide cloud services and they provide cloud storage. Uh, same with Facebook. Everything is on the cloud. Your application, your pictures, all your profiles are on their cloud. So these companies tend to build their own hyperscale data centers. One thing important about hyperscale data centers are they tend to have a very small PUE, power usage efficiency, meaning they, they could go as low as 1.1, meaning if your actual usage in a 1.1 PUE is 100 watts, you're consuming 110 watts. So their efficiency is very high and could go less. Uh, they usually have their own power generation plants. Uh, they have their a complete ecosystem that runs these uh, data centers. And because of the scale, they can reach a very low PUE compared to an enterprise data center that could be running at 1.6 or 1.8 uh, power usage efficiency or PUE. Uh, co-location data centers are also larger and bigger data centers. However, these data centers are, are shared. So they are built by companies that sell you the infrastructure or build the infrastructure and sell you the space inside their data center so you can run your services. So you can, so like let's say Aconex will build a big facility, it has space inside, and then you can go now, you can either rent a, a, a rack space or you can take a cage that fits like 10 racks or 5 racks, depending on your requirement and their business model, you can find different providers that do co-location and can give you different things. Or in some cases, you can also uh, rent uh, processing power and storage as well. So you go into that part and then it's more of a managed services uh, offering from these data centers. Now going to enterprise uh, data centers. Enterprise data centers are privately owned data centers and we see them a lot with the banks, which we see the banks now also who own enterprise data center are preferring maybe to go and do a co-location or uh, buy a managed service and buy like just storage in a Google Cloud or uh, take their processing and storage from uh, AWS or Azure or Google Cloud, which they offer these services. So we see this migration that makes sense. You don't need to manage your own data center. You don't need that liability with your at your end with your company. You move it out and you just uh, either uh, take a co-location space based on your needs or go with full cloud and just take uh, the requirements you need. But again, we see a lot of enterprise data centers uh, running applications, different types. Usually these are applications related to the owner of the company. So a bank will have their own uh, records and everything in, the, in, in that data center. Same with telecom operators as well. They, they tend to have their own or smaller enterprise companies depending on the business or in a factory. Again, edge data centers. Talked about this before. So they're placed closer to the edge. Uh, one application where we see edge data centers a lot is in uh, Industry 4.0, where now we have these smart factories that they need to, a factory is operating 
and it's collecting data and if if action needs to be taken based on the data can be collected and the analysis on the site you don't want to depend on a cloud far away to take an action on the site so these uh, data centers run locally on the floor closer to the machines where they can do the processing and communicate between different parts of a of a production factory and uh, give more information back. Uh, one application it can be here is quality control um, uh, in a car production facility where you have these high resolution cameras looking at cars coming out from a production line and they can send this these images they, these are heavy images so these are high megapixel images that are being sent you don't want to send them on the cloud you send them to a local server local data center where you have uh, custom applications running there uh, ai applications uh, they are processing these images looking at these images if there is any uh, imperfections then this information is processed and fed back to uh, the floor and these uh, quality control issues are corrected on the fly before the cars are out of the factory. So these kind of applications, I'm, I'm trying to be generic uh, on that sense, but these are applications where we see edge data centers. Let's talk about data center components. So I talked about the different types of the data centers and how it's growing, but all these types, they have uh, same components. So when we talk about components, there's three main uh, components of every data center. First is the IT part, which we all see and know. That's the IT part set that, up. That's that includes the servers, uh, the IT cables, the IT infrastructure, the switches that connect everything together and connect the data center to the world. And when we have the power that powers that data center, and this includes transformers, generation, uh, power generation plants or gensets, a fueling system that fuels that, uh, the UPSs, the batteries, and the power panels and the power cabling that runs up to the racks from the generation source. Now, with all this power and IT running, and, and we've seen uh, cabinet capacity go from three kilowatt multiplied by hundreds of times as, as data centers grow. Uh, so there is a lot of heat dissipated and we need a cooling system to keep the data center in an optimal operating, uh, in an optimal operating uh, temperature or condition. So we see chiller plants, pump system, uh, humidification, humidification also, also the humidity is an important factor to maintain. So these are the main components of a data center, but there's other systems that also support uh, these systems that run in a data center. And here we see uh, mainly the physical equipment solutions, which are raised floors, uh, tiles, uh, the racks some themselves, the, the containment that holds the cabling and everything. Uh, we have the physical security system, which comprises of the access control, the CCTV, the gates, the fencing, the man traps. And later I will be focusing on this later and talking about a layered approach of protecting a data center. So we'll talk about five layers of a data center protection in the final section of this presentation. There's also the fire detection and suppression system, and these are mainly safety system because as much as we want to protect the data center, we also want to protect uh, the lives of the people operating there and make sure it's a safe environment to operate uh, in a data center. And there is also the data center information management system, which brings everything together and controls and gives a view for the operators of what's going on in their data centers. So moving on, talking about the tier levels and uh, in a data center and uh, tier topology categories. So in a data center, uh, the, the standards or the regulations are that we have four tier level from tier one to tier four. Uh, so they are either tier one to tier four or class one to class four, depending if you're following uh, uptime or ITU or different standards. Uh, one thing to note that there is no fractional tier. So if you have your power on tier three and you have your uh, cooling on tier two, 
uh, designed and built, your data center will end up to be a tier two. You cannot have like, uh, okay, I have redundancy here and I missed the point here, then no, that's that doesn't work. So always a tier level is based on uh, on the lowest tier of uh, of any system rating in, in your data center. Um, and this helps in quick communication. So data center tiers provide a concise way to convey essential details about data center facilities. So it establishes expectations and uh, sets it clear uh, for cost, availability, and redundancy. So when you, you hear tier three, you know what that means. You know and it's concurrently maintainable. Uh, I have an availability of 999.98%, uh, uh, and I have a downtime expectation of uh, 1.6 hours. And I took an example. So I don't need to go into details when I'm looking for to to host my services or to to hire a data center or to put my servers in a co-location data center if it's tier three i know all this information i know i am guaranteed this uh, quality of service when i do that so let's talk about the these tier levels and how they are classified so to classify a uh, tier uh, tier level we look at two topology categories. One is the capacity component and the diversity of distribution path. So, and I will talk in details about those, what, what do I mean by capacity component? So the capacity component means the load that can be handled by a data center. So let's take an example, and I'll go back after this to show you that in a power system example. But first, when I'm talking about capacity component, take a single person who is required to go to work, and he would need one car to go to work every day. So that's his need. It's N is one car. Now, if I want a redundancy of N plus one, I, he, I will get or he will buy another car and now he has N, one car, plus one, another car that in case of his need falls, he has another car that will support him. Now to understand more how that would work when we have more components, let's take this same person now after a few years, he has a partner that lives with him, he has a family and now him and his other half go to work and everyone needs a car to go work. So now their need is two cars. Now, N plus one is still another car, so they have three N as total capacity. So now, two, uh, N plus one is still a redundant, is a redundant solution. When we go to take this into data centers, if I have uh, a data center that requires uh, 100 kilowatt of power, I can either choose to, so my need is 100 kilowatt. I can have two UPSs, each 50, or I can have one UPS of 100 kilowatt. If I use one UPS of 100 kilowatt, N plus one will be 200, so 100 plus 100. If I use uh, a UPS of 50 kilowatt, so my need is 100 kilowatt, so I need two UPSs, 50 plus 50. Now my plus one is another 50, so my total capacity or my total support UPS is 150 kilowatt, and now I have my N, which is 50 plus 50, 100 kilowatt, that's my need. And I have another 50 kilowatt, that's my plus one, that is the redundant component that I need to run my system. So in this case, when we design a data center, we try to split the N into uh, multiple factors. So if I capacity is 100 kilowatt, or let's say 300 kilowatt capacity, I will get three UPSs, each of 100, and I add 100 UPS. So total, I will get 400 kilowatt UPS capacity. Three are the need, and plus one is the capacity. And this why we can reduce the cost of data center while maintaining the tier level requirement in terms of uh, capacity components. Now, let's look at the... Uh, path diversity. So we have the capacity component. The path diversity means that the way I want to deliver this uh, power should go through two different paths. So if I have a single point of failure in that path, if I if I have one power panel where these two uh, UPS systems or paths meet, then it's a single path. Then I lose the redundancy in the path. So I don't have a path uh, diversity. So these are the two uh, topology categories that define, based on them, we define a data center tier level. <clears throat> so again, let's 
look in detail of each of these tier levels. So tier four means fault tolerant. And here we are, we have 99.995 availability and we expect a downtown of 0.04 hours every year, which is very less. In tier three, we call this concurrently maintainable, means you can maintain the data center while it's running. And here we get 99.982 availability and expected downtime per year is 1.6 hours. In tier two, we have a redundant solution, a redundant UPS. And here we have 99.749 availability and annual downtime of 22 hours a year. Tier one is non-redundant. And we have 99.6 availability and uh, expected downtime per year is 28.8 hours. And remember, if I have a single component between the power electrical uh, and IT that is non-redundant, I fall directly to tier one. So if I want to go to tier two, all these three components that I have, the main components of the data center need to be redundant. Let's take an example now of uh, an electric system. And first we'll look at a tier one, where is a non-redundant system. And you see here we have uh, N, which N is two UPS modules. And in this case, if we take N is a uh, 100 kilowatt, then each N is 50 kilowatt, okay? So here there is no redundancy. We have N, only the need, which is two UPSs. So this is a non-redundant system. And that's tier one. Tier two, we have an N plus one redundancy in this case. And as we explained, we have three UPS, which is equal to N plus one. Two of the UPSs are the need, and plus one is for redundancy. So in case any UPS fails, one of these UPS fails, the power will move automatically to that standby UPS, and we will not have interruption to the data center uh, operations. Now, keep in mind that I'm showing only the electrical system, but this redundancy should be similar, as I said, on the three components of a data center to maintain this tier level. Now, in a tier three, a concurrently maintainable uh, data center, uh, and why we call it concurrently maintainable, as I said, because you can uh, maintain the data center. You can take a component and fix it or replace it while the data center is running. So here, it's not only about redundancy in the capacity component, we also need a diversified path. So we have already redundancy uh, at one side. So we have redundancy in the, in the power system at one end. And on the other end, we have a diversified path. We have another path from another source. So if anything fails at this end, and you see there is no single point of failure up to the rack, up to your switch, there is no single point of failure. So there is no common uh, boards here to this power distribution boards. It's a separate uh, utility source from here. There's two different generators in here all coming through different uh, automatic transfer switch all the way to the rack. So in this case here, we have the redundancy of two N plus one, of N plus one, that's three UPSs, plus at the same time, we have two distribution paths. So if anything goes wrong in this solution, uh, so let's say a, a UPS fails on, it keeps going through the other UPS. So the ATS will switch the power here and the data center continues to operate. However, also when I want to replace this UPS now, I can switch the load to the other path that's already available for me. It's an alternative path that I can activate at any time. I can do any changes in here and then re-switch the power to this redundant path. And this is a tier three data center. If we have the same redundancy concept on the cooling and on the IT part. In a tier four, that's fault tolerant. That means uh, both paths are simultaneously active. They are both active and we have N. So we have uh, the requirement need for the load after any failure. So if any of the UPSs fail, we always have N that is available and we have always two routes that are available to take the, the load of the data center. So this is of course concurrently maintainable and at the same time it's fault tolerant. And this is a tier four data center if we have the same redundancy 
on the other components of the data center. See, so we have two different spade path with redundancy at both. So let's try to guess what is this design here. It passed through, but can you, I'll give you a minute just to look at it and guess between yourself, what is this? If you don't, you can go back in the video and check uh, what tier level this design was. It passed with us just a while back. So now let's talk about the physical security requirements in a data center. And when we talk about that, we start with access control requirement and mainly we need to control access to our data center. We want to make sure who is coming into our data center and if they are coming into our data center, where they are going and where they are allowed to go. And if they're going outside of that allowed parameter or allowed location, we want to know about that. And if somebody is not allowed, we want to detect any intrusion uh, to our uh, data center or to our premises at any time. So. Controlling access is the main goal for us now. For that, we need to have physical barriers like the fences, the gates, the doors, the windows in our buildings, everything that will prevent people from going into restricted areas, being from the fence outside to the buildings, to the racks themselves. Again, thinking of that layered approach. To do that, we need electronic system that help us manage and control these physical barriers. And also we need the policies and the procedures that will let us understand how these things are run in a data center. And of course, we need the staff that is trained and ready to operate and ready to respond with procedures and SOPs if anything happens in the data centers. So today, my focus will be mainly on the electronic system and mainly on the surveillance system and how we can make use of the surveillance system and the technology available in the surveillance system to fortify a data center in each layer that we will look at. And when I say layer, I'm talking about five layers, starting from the premises, to from the parameter to the premises to the buildings to the rack itself so we have a five layered uh, security approach first we look at the parameter security and that's uh, the fence and, and, and anything outside the fence uh, of our facility the premises is everything inside our fence but outside our buildings and then the buildings are the buildings themselves and then down into the server room where our racks are and then we go granule and we want to also secure the racks inside the server rooms and inside the data center floor. So as I go through these layers, I will look at technologies and the technology that is available today that will help us secure data center and access to our data center from a surveillance perspective. And that's if that makes sense. So looking at the parameter security, and that is uh, the outmost layer uh, that detects movement around our facility and anybody trying to go inside. And this will include the fences, the gates, uh, cameras, and intrusion detection systems. And if, if, you, if you go and search about intrusion detection and anything related, you will see that there is a lot of uh, technologies out there from LiDAR to fiber fencing to sensor fences. All these technologies are available that will allow us to monitor if there is any intrusion or any movement around the facility that we can look at. But what I want to talk about is now this application, which is Access Parameter Defender. And this is an application for parameter surveillance and protection. Uh, it's mainly ideal for high security parameter protection where there is a need to strengthen the physical access control system with reliable intrusion detection. So it helps us detect and verify any potential intruder at the parameter of our facility. Uh, it's mainly run with thermal cameras that can cover longer distances. So a thermal camera will be placed uh, over the fence and it will look over the fence. It will classify humans and vehicle. Uh, we can define multiple detection scenarios. So when people come closer, we want to be alerted. However, they are still outside the fence. We don't see threat. So depending on the zone they are, we can define different uh, alerts. Uh, and at the same time, that uh, thermal camera that's looking over the fence 
is integrated with a pan tilt zoom aptz camera that can track any movement and give us verification of what's happening in the scene and so on and so on so if someone in the operating center when they get or in the security center when they get a notification they can look at the PTZ, which is automatically tracking that movement. They don't need to go and look and then get verification of what's happening in the scene. And usually for this application, you would need a thermal camera to detect, uh, a PTZ camera to verify, and then you combine that with uh, an IP speaker, either closer, uh, closer to the set. So you have different IP speakers across the fence that you can, based on the location, uh, trigger that speaker and uh, either do a pre-recorded message or directly talk and page that area, asking them to leave, letting them know that they have been detected and somebody knows they are there and they are doing something wrong or whatever. So it, it helps deter the action before it's happening. Uh, another important thing that we see now because is drone detection and uh, drone protection. So we, you don't only need to protect uh, your data center on the ground level, you also need to protect those data centers at the space level above the data center, above ground. So it's not only the ground, it's the ground and the airspace above your data center. So there's different trader systems that can detect uh, drones. You can combine that with access cameras that can uh, detect, uh, sorry, verify the drone uh, in an area. And then these radars can only be uh, combined with the defense systems that can bring uh, drones down and uh, eliminate the threat before it's too close to your data centers. Uh, another application that uh, I want to talk about is uh, access object analytics, which is a deep learning analytics that run on the access devices. Uh, it's mainly what it does, it classifies different objects in the scene so it can classify uh, different types of vehicle or a human and based on that classification now we can have scenarios that run that uh, detect uh, if an area where cars are not allowed you see a car you know it's detected then you can alert them speak them that they are restricting uh, in a restricted area this video shows us um, a visualization of uh, access object analytics when it's running, you can see that uh, it can identify different objects in the scene, like uh, cars, bikes, trucks. Uh, it can also uh, identify a human when walking in the scene. So based on these analytics and uh, classifications, we can have uh, action rules or uh, actions that relate to each of uh, these objects being in a certain area or having a uh, certain pattern in the scene. So what, what we saw before is a video from a camera looking and putting bounding boxes above, above objects. So what's happening in, in the camera, and when I talked about the edge at the beginning and how the edge is becoming smarter and we have deep learning processors on the edge, this is what's happening in the back end. So that, that's the difference. Now, the camera is looking at the scene it's just it's not just transmitting the image it's looking at the scene and it's analyzing the scene so it's describing the scene with metadata and what metadata is is description of what's happening in a scene so i look in a scene i would if you ask me to describe what's happening on a scene i would tell you okay i look i'm looking at the field uh, there's a gate at the, uh, the right side, uh, there's a yellow car going from the gate, it's parked in the second spot. Uh, I have a person getting down from the car, he's wearing a gray top with uh, dark uh, pants, he's moving at a certain speed from the car going east. So now all this, what I'm saying, these are this is metadata, this is like person in the scene, car in the scene, moving from the gate to the parking lot, uh, occupying parking lot two. So now this metadata is being collected. So now if I wanna go back and search, I would say, okay, what time was plot parking plot number two occupied? This data is available. I don't need to go back and look at the video to see when a car moved in. The, the, the video is tagged 
with that metadata so I can go directly to those certain points where plot number two in the parking was occupied. And, it, and there is a lot of metadata being collected. What I said in AUA now, we're classifying objects. So if there is a person in there, there's a human, there's a car, there's a bike, there's a truck, there's a bus, I can search for that. I know that and it's collected and it's sent to your VMS and other things. So when this, this brings me to the next slide. So what's happening with this data that's being collected? First thing, we take this video and metadata, it goes to the video management system and it's immediately analyzed or there is action rules that are linked to this data. So if I have a data center and I know that cars are not allowed on the backside of the fence, now the moment that camera sees a car, it knows there's a car in the scene. I don't need somebody to look uh, in the control center and see the car. The first thing it will do, I have a siren strobe there that will go red alerting the car that there is something wrong, that it is in a restricted area. And then I have a speaker at that location that can immediately uh, play a pre-recorded message telling them, you are in a restricted area, please leave the area. Authorities have been notified. At the same time, I have a trigger on the video pan uh, screen in the uh, security control center that pops up showing that car in there. If the operator sees that the car is not leaving, they can press a button and talk through the speaker to them. They can dispatch uh, a security guard to go be at that location. So now we're doing that proactive security uh, response. We have that deterring uh, factor with the car. At the same time, this metadata will be collected and is being collected, can be used for business intelligence. So we have the action rules and that immediate response uh, and at the same time, we have that uh, business intelligence part where we collect this data now. We know what's happening in our facility. We know how many cars come every day, like from the main gate. We know how many people on pedestrian cross through. And in different applications, this could be valuable. Imagine this in a retail shop where you know where people are going within your store. This could be very valuable. Um, in a data center inside the floor, if you want to track who, how many times, if you're in a co-location, who's visiting the data center more, and then you can also, it, 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 can, it can lead to a lot of uh, uh, operational efficiency in many ways and, and, and cases in that sense. This is another video of Access Object Analytics, and here we're running uh, time and area scenario uh, or loitering. So you can see the line under the object uh, represents the threshold of time, and when that time is exceeded or is reached, there's an alert uh, that goes. So a car staying there for more than the threshold will trigger an alarm. So moving into the premises and into the premises, we want to control movement within the facility. So now we know someone, uh, if they are unauthorized, we will detect them and do action at the fence. If they are authorized, they went inside. We want to make sure that they are going where they are authorized to go to because not everybody within the premises, if somebody is coming to maintain the generator set or the UPS, they shouldn't be on the floor uh, in there. So access control plays a big part of it. Security guards and uh, that accompany them inside is another thing. Uh, surveillance cameras within the facility to detect and uh, monitor their motion within the facility is another part. And again, uh, the AUA, access object and analytics and object classification and tracking plays an important part in the control of the movement within the building. So the way we can see uh, this within a facility is we have radars and cameras within the facility running AUA access object analytics that can detect the movement of people. We can have PTZs track them as they go around. And when they enter restricted areas, we can be notified because we have already these action rules based on the metadata that we set uh, predefined that will alert a speaker, pre-recorded message, or will allow us to talk to them directly as well inside the facility. <clears throat> Moving into the building, 
we want to protect the physical buildings themselves. Uh, if people are not allowed to go into the building, they don't have business to go. It's only on a need to uh, come. So the access control, key cards, biometric scanners, all this comes part of building security. Uh, and these are different scenarios that I will talk about in this sense. And when I talk building security, we have also, we have the HVAC or the uh, environment monitoring system has outdoor components that are part of the building, but they are outside. We have the power facilities, the power generation and the power transformation are part of the building, but are sit outside the building. And these are areas where people are not allowed to be in unless they are there for a certain purpose. So we can set the uh, object in area detection. And if we did detect a human going into these areas, we can immediately uh, display something that will tell them that they are in a restricted area. This video of AOA represents uh, an object in area detection. And you can see that this is a pedestrian uh, only area. When the car comes into the boxed area, we have an immediate uh, alarm or alert from the camera. Another application that is not very much for security, but maybe for safety that we can use uh, cameras to help with is uh, temperature variation detect detection. And we can use thermal cameras that look over our uh, generation plant or our transform transformers and cooling equipment. And then we can, uh, using an isothermic camera that detects uh, thermal energy, we can uh, detect an increase in temperature, we set thresholds, and based on that, we can issue alarms, uh, noting our operators that temperature is going high. Another application which uh, we find cameras very helpful with is smoke detection uh, within the premises. So this could be inside the data center, or it could be outside the data center in the power facilities or the cooling facilities. And the good thing about detecting smoke with cameras is that when you use a camera to detect smoke, you have a fire detection earlier on uh, than using a smoke detector. Uh, so fire detection based on video reacts faster than traditional smoke detectors because in a traditional system, you need the smoke to get up to reach to your smoke detector and then you will get an alarm. Well, although this is uh, not a safety, maybe uh, certified application for life and safety applications, you still need to have your smoke detectors, you still need to have your uh, sprinklers and the other systems, but what this allows you is an early detection of smoke, so you can look at it, verify it, and take action maybe two or three minutes before a fire is started or before your alarms, fire alarm system is notified or smoke detection is notified, allowing you to save lives and save equipment in your facility. So going to the fourth layer, which is uh, the server room security. So now we're in that. So we enter the building and from the building, we, we want to go into the server room. So there is only people who need to be there need to be there. So there's additional access uh, control system allowing people to stay out or go inside. Uh, there's additional surveillance inside the facility because we want to know whoever is there, what they are doing, if they are touching any equipment that they shouldn't be touching. And of course, there's the environmental monitoring that's already in there. So in here, we see different uses of technology uh, from detection based on different types of camera and verification using PTZs. If we suspect any motion, we can zoom in and uh, go closer to that area and uh, detect what's going on. And as always, IP speakers are used to uh, talk down and speak to whoever is in there, either with pre-recorded messages or uh, live. At the fifth layer, and here we see the security at the rack level. So what we see here is mainly surveillance within the rack and high security applications. So there is uh, small cameras like pinhole cameras or hidden cameras that go inside the racks. And these will help you detect uh, or record 
any activity within the rack. This is more of operational and security uh, application for data security. So you don't want you want to know if somebody plugs in a USB in, in, in the server or whatnot. At the same time, we also have uh, PTZs with 360 coverage around the racks that will help cover this one, in addition to access control into each rack. And the level of security here depends on the type of facility. If this is an enterprise data center, maybe it will be, with, and there is one uh, operate, uh, operation management team taking care of the data center, then it's but less loose. But if you are in a co-location data center, you wanna keep more track of who's accessing the rack. And if they are in the server room, what they are allowed to access, and if they access it, what they are doing inside these racks. Um, and with this, uh, I come to the end of my uh, presentation today. Um, please, if uh, you've watched so far, uh, leave me a comment. Let me know that you've uh, been through the presentation and give me your feedback on it. Um, as well, if, uh, if you could subscribe to the channel, that would be great. You'll encourage me to do more videos like this. Um, yeah, and uh, hopefully I'll see you soon in another video. Thank you very much.